This is Art Sense, a podcast focused on educating and informing listeners about the past, present, and future of art. I'm Craig Gould. First up this week is my conversation with author Carolyn Schlamm regarding her new book, The Joy of Art, How to Look at, Appreciate, and Talk About Art. Schlamm has set out to write a book that guides the art viewing experience from an artist's perspective. In segment two, I speak to artist Terrell James about her work. James is a master of colorful abstraction based on the influence of landscapes. Her work is exhibited worldwide it can be found in major collections like MFA Boston, MFA Houston, the Mino Collection, and the Whitney Museum of American Art. At the end of the episode, I'll be wrapping things up with some of the week's top art headlines. But first up, the joy of art. Carolyn Schlamm, thank you very much for being willing to join me on the podcast today. To, to talk about your new book, The Joy of Art, How to Look at, Appreciate, and Talk About Art. Can you Thank ta- you so much, Greg. Yeah, so can, can you kind of give us an overview of your book? My first book um, was published in 2018. It's called The Creative Path. It was a, a book I uh, created for, kind of an inspirational book uh, for artists, for creative people. And uh, it's about the creative process. And... Oh, once I once I completed the book and got it published and went through the whole process, I was eager to to go again. Right. And uh, I happened to um, that year. I was I live in California now, but I I'm originally from New York, and I had the opportunity to be in New York. Um, it was a Picasso sculpture exhibit at the oh, time. Oh, right, I remember at, that. At, at MoMA, and I was really looking forward to it. And I happened to be there just at that time. So I, I went to the exhibit and it was packed. Uh, uh, it was impossible to get close to any work and, and everyone was, there were crowds at every key snapping photos with their smartphones and it was so frustrating. And I, I started to wonder what are all of these um, eager visitors going to do with all these photographs and does it make any sense? You know, they're gonna just, do they really see what they were came to see? Mm-hmm. So uh, the idea was born at that moment, and it developed into uh, my original title for the proposed book was called at that time, Come to the Museum with Me, An Artist Looks at Art. And my, my concept, of course, you know, publishers always these days want to change titles to make them, um, you know, uh, uh, pop up on the web. So uh, anyhow, but that was my working title. And the idea was to really take a look at art um, and to write a book from the artist's point of view, not a um, not an academic book, uh, not a treatise, not uh, art history, uh, but just a kind of an art, a toolkit. That's really what I had in mind, a toolkit for looking at art. I was thinking of all those people at the Picasso Sculpture exhibit. Mm-hmm. And uh, so it actually, uh, you know, sometimes ideas come into your head and they, it, it seemed very doable at the time. Although now looking back on it, that was quite an ambitious goal <laughs> uh, to attack the whole of Western art uh, sure. <laughs> and the organizational problems. But I lit into it and uh, uh, the uh, my publisher was eager to do a second book and uh, he liked the idea, and I sold the book on a just a description. Wow! So that was that was great, and uh, the book finally, I uh, we had a, a it took a couple of years the entire process of writing the book, of going through the, all the copyright issues, and finally it was published in 2020. It came out in April 2020. Of course, the the world was a little distracted in April of 2020, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> That was not the most advantageous time to have a book, although in retrospect, now thinking about it, um, it actually was a, a quite excellent time because mm-hmm. um, there are people at home with, you know, a lot of extra time on their hands and 
people started picking up the book and it, it started selling. And it, it has actually amazed me how well the book has done. It is now, uh, I, I love to go online and, and see where it is, where it's, and I've seen it in um, South Africa and mm-hmm. Singapore and Malaysia and all over the world. And just a few weeks ago, uh, I had the great honor of selling the book to a Chinese publisher. It's already about to be published in Korean, wow. and now it's going to be translated into Chinese. So the joy of art is now making its way around the world, and it's, it's very exciting. Instead of it being necessarily an art one classroom sort of textbook, it sounds like you're trying to help novices appreciate and view art from the eyes of an artist. Is that is that about right? Yes, you, you've explained it very well. Uh, in, you know, I, um, I wanted it deliberately not to be, you know, it disturbs me as an artist that art is such an elitist, uh, it's not an elitist pursuit because there are plenty of starving artists pursuing their careers as artists. But the, the purchasers of art and the admirers of art uh, often fall into this elite group. And my goal was to make um, my passion for art really accessible to the many, many, many people who get off cruise ships and go into art museums and, and really enjoy looking at art and uh, there are so many people. So I wanted the book to be uh, very accessible. Not, uh, I, I, I don't believe in, in even when I uh, write books for children, I like them to be high-minded. I like children to have mm-hmm. to stride. I, I use a complicated vocabulary. I don't, um, you know, I have respect for my reader. And uh, Mm -hmm. so there's a lot of information in the book. You really do get um, a toolkit for what to look for when you step up to a work of art, what you are looking at. And um, the book also, I I imagined it almost as a, um, like a seminar class in Mm -hmm. a sense, where um, readers would be, we'd be in a room of 15 students and myself and we'd be looking at art and we'd be uh, conversing about it and noticing things and, and asking questions. So even though my audience is not with me, I do ask many, many questions in the book and there are uh, many thought provoking um, issues for readers to grapple with and to make it really fun uh, I added a section at the end where you can test your new knowledge with a whole bunch of games and exercises I made up uh, for you to see if you've really, if you uh, if you've really gotten it. That's great. It so, sounds like we need to create an app that, to go along with your book to you know test people's knowledge. Well, it, it, it could be a, uh, I, you know, if you look at the reviews of the book have been really excellent and uh, everybody seems to feel that uh, they are really getting something out of the book I, because I'm not talking down to them. Mm-hmm. Some of the material is difficult, but it is written in a very engaging and conversational, I guess you would say, style, mm-hmm. uh, which I want to what I want to do is to converse with my reader, even though they are far away in Singapore and South Africa. And uh, some of these folks actually um, get in touch with me and talk to me about my books. As a matter of fact, I had a, a reader contact me recently who told me, imagine this as a, an author, that this person had read my book twice. <laughs> And she wasn't, once was not enough. She read it again and uh, she, uh, it, it, it so increased her zest for, for art that um, she started to think about making some art herself. That's great. And uh, I, I, uh, I've done some workbooks for um, children, art workbooks, and I have now decided to create a series of workbooks for adults. That's great. I don't know. I don't know if um, 
uh, it, it, the concept and, and prototype is with my um, is with my agent now. I don't know what, what success she will have uh, trying to sell it, but it's you know one thing leads to another. And sure. So I mean, I know from uh, from an education perspective, you know, there's this principle of of scaffolding. You you kind of cover one set of ground and then you come back and talk about it a little bit more in depth and keep kind of going up the ladder. Where do you did you feel like you needed to start in the book to to give people kind of a foundation before you started getting deeper? Okay. Well, first, uh, I always start with the language because we with uh, the vocabulary. There's a whole vocabulary of art, and if you don't speak the language, you cannot. Uh, there's a limit to how far you can go in in appreciating and understanding art. So, we start with the vocabulary. And I explain the vocabulary of art and various artistic practices uh, and make them understandable. And um, then um, I turn to, um, well, I I came up with uh, a chapter called 20 Questions and One More for Good Measure. And uh, in which I posed uh, 21 uh, aesthetic questions and and answered them in short form not lengthy extremely lengthy answers and and uh i provided them more as kind of food for thought okay that for the aesthetic questions for the the art new um and budding art level lover to consider Mm -hmm. these are things to think about about art generally so you have the 20 questions uh, then in the book, we turn to, um, uh, I have some uh, quotes from famous artists and explain them in context. The book takes a, uh, I decided to take a formalist approach with the book. Mm-hmm. In other words, uh, if, if one was taking a you know, contextual approach, the other alternative, mm-hmm. I would explaining the work in the context of their period, or their the, the, the particular movement that they were part of, etc. I chose and to, uh, to talk about the works of art. And there are 150 photographs in the book, so you get to look at a lot of art from all different periods. But I chose to look at them from a formalist point of view. In right. other words, in and of themselves. Right. Um, regardless of their context and it is an interesting way to look at things because there are things that were done hundreds of years ago that are incredibly modern Mm -hmm. and you would not even believe were accomplished so many years ago and vice versa sure so uh, that's the basic approach to the book i i go into the general criteria for um uh, for viewing and and appreciating and understanding art and then very specific criteria that relate to the specific genre or the art form, et cetera. And then uh, I have lots of secrets and things you may not have known about your favorite artists uh, and clues to why they did what they did. Okay. From an artist's point of view, you have to remember, I've been, I've been there. I've been <laughs> at the Google trying to resolve these these questions and problems and I, I i i kind of give you the inside view what are some of those inside views that you uh narrowed in on well i have a great story about uh kandinsky mm-hmm. i don't know whether it's apocryphal or not but i uh, read that uh kandinsky uh who um we know as an abstract artist was actually uh, decided one day to take a walk and he, his maid was cleaning the studio. And when he returned from the, his walk, his, um, his maid had turned the piece he was working on sideways. And upon looking at it and seeing it as if for the first time, he gasped and he said, that's amazing. That's the way it's meant to be made. <laughs> And and abstract art was created. Great. So I imagine you know you uh, you described the the elements of art: line, form, color. Have you gotten any particular feedback from readers 
as to uh, parts of the book that they especially re- resonate with them? You know, I, I've, uh, I'm trying to think. The book is very cohesive, you know, so each chapter uh, leads to the next and, you know, you you learn, uh, you learn about the general criteria for looking at art and it kind of gives you the framework when you turn to the specific genres, you, you kind of, uh, you have, you have some backing as to, uh, you know, it, it just it takes off very um, sequentially and Developed at the at the one of the last chapters, which I think I think I think probably this is the one that people seem to like the best. Um, it's called chapter thirteen. It's called a closer look decoding works of art. Mm-hmm. What I did was I I took um, work uh, in say with a sim- similar subject, uh, similar theme, uh, 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 color, what whatever. And there are t- ten. I think there are ten different examples, and we compare and contrast okay. using using all the language we've learned to this point. Having looked at now a hundred pieces of work, you now have you have the vocabulary, you have the references, you 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 you're able to, and we compare and contrast. We decode deconstruct in a sense sure. how how um it's very difficult to especially with painting to understand i i explain try to explain this in many ways it's very difficult to deconstruct a painting because when we look at a painting we only see the final version mm-hmm. it has been constructed piece by piece but we don't get to see all the pieces we only get to see and in many cases all the construction lines and so forth have disappeared. So um, it, it's, it is difficult to read. Mm-hmm. It is difficult to read. But once, you know, all this that you've learned about how a, pe- how a painting is made, when you get to this chapter of decoding works, you actually can pull it apart. You can actually are able to deconstruct it. At least that's what I attempted to do. And people have told me that they... Um, uh, you know that they enjoyed that chapter, that they got a lot out of it, and and the best, very best thing of all is that many people who have written to me and also who have written reviews of the book have said that they're really looking forward to going back to the museum now that they've read the book. That's great. You're uh, you're a painter, right? I believe you do you do figurative portrait type of work, correct? I am well currently. I I am a painter and a glass artist. Oh, wow. But I've also, but I've also worked in, um, like many artists, I've worked in ceramics. I've I've sculpted in wood. Sure. Uh, we will call, we will call you interdisciplinary. How about that? Most artists are interdisciplinary because we can't resist. You know, we love all these great materials. Absolutely. So, but um, predominantly, I started. Um, well, I I, saw, I studied for many years from studied from life, and then but then in early, my early years in the studio, I did mostly abstract work, and then little by little, I began. You know, as you develop as an artist, you begin to zero in. Mm-hmm. So I kind of zeroed in on figurative work. Um, I I love to draw from life from the live model, uh, but I also do studies and sometimes work from photographs, composites of photographs, and um, so I do predominantly figurative work but i am actually now trying to uh you know i i always describe this that the difference between abstraction semi-abstraction and realism i describe them as stops on a train Mm -hmm. you always every piece starts in abstraction so every piece is abstract and then more and more you particularize and specify and Eventually, you can come up with the dot on a nose, and it can be as as uh, total photo photorealism. But it it starts every piece starts as an abstract work. So, Absolutely. I I um, you know, it's a, now I'm I'm kind of retracing a bit. I'm doing still doing figurative work, but with the abstract elements, um, um, you know, more exposed. I would say. They're always there, but more exposed. Sure. 
And so were you able to include some of your work as examples in the book? Not only was I able to include my own work, and this I think people will really appreciate, because I, uh, the, my publisher would not permit me to buy copyrights, and you cannot, most of the work of, of artists who are uh, have not uh, been dead 75 years are mm-hmm. still under copyright. Right. I couldn't include any modern art. Mm. How could I? How could I write a book about art and not have a Picasso and a Matisse? Right. I was. I couldn't figure it out. Well, the book was delayed because of the pandemic. And as a result, a Picasso and a Matisse came off copyright. Wow. So they made the book. But because I couldn't use that many modern artists and and a number of foundations would not agree to, a a few did, the Diebenkorn Foundation gave me two Diebenkorns to put in the book. He's a favorite of mine. what I did was I suddenly realized it's it's nice to have, um, you know, familiar works of art in the book when you're talking about art. But really, mm-hmm. why? Any work of art can uh, can we can discuss the, the elements of art in any work of art. Sure. So I decided I'll just include some of my favorite people who are still living. There you go. And my favorite painters. So Jimmy Wright, who's a friend of mine, he made the book with one of his self-portraits. I, I saw a, uh, a work online by um, uh, a, um, a, a, a um, ceramicist that I liked very much. I called her up and asked if she'd like to have a piece in the book. So um, that was very thrilling to me that I was able to include. There are some pieces of my own, and and I was able to include other living artists and there we're very very grateful and so was i that's great and so yeah. carolyn where where would people find your book uh well i, I hate to say that uh, amazon.com but it's really sold the joy of art how to look at appreciate and talk about art is sold everywhere it's in um, small bookstores it's obviously on Amazon. It's on, at Barnes & Noble. It seems like it's a great everywhere. fit for uh, the museum books or the museum gift shop, oh, doesn't it? Oh, yes, absolutely. I would love to. I, I Years ago, I, I was a member of the Museum Stores Association. They put out a newsletter. I'm, I'm about to put an ad in their uh, buyer's guide for the book. And uh, Yes, it, it, it would be great. And I just, in, in my recent search, I found out that the book was even... Uh, listed in the Harvard bookstore. That's great. The college bookstore, which is really thrilling because it means the book is being used by by um, college students. And and I, I'd love to do a sequel. I'd love to do something. Uh, who knows what will happen? And we'll see how, you know, you have one has to prove oneself as an author. But uh, I think that sale to China is going to help quite a bit. So. Well, Carolyn, I, I really appreciate uh, your time today. Is there is there a website where people can keep track of um, of your your written work and your artwork? Like, how can people well, follow you? Yeah, there's my website, carolynschlam.com. And um, if you just Google my name, Carolyn Schlam, you'll find lots on the web. And um, but my website is the best place. And uh, uh, Amazon has it. I have an Amazon page, you know, Instagram, all the rest. Just my name. That's okay. all you need to know. So thank you so much, Craig. Yeah. I, it's been a real pleasure talking to you. And I know how intimidating uh, this this whole field can be for someone that is totally new to it. And I appreciate you cracking the door open to let people come in and, and really feel like they can um own uh, an artistic viewing experience and so thank you so much and let me just add if you don't mind at the end that please anybody who wishes i always uh respond to uh people who write to me to fans of the book or people who just have questions whatever i'd love to hear from folks so you know just write to me through the website and um uh, you'll get a, a quick answer. Oh, cool. And thank you. Thank everyone in advance, and I hope you enjoy the book. Wonderful. Thank well, thank you for your time today. The other day, I was having a conversation with my son, Josh. Son, how old are you? 15. And so, what kind of things are you interested in? 
filmmaking, art, stuff like that. A lot of times at bedtime you come into the office in, at night and we talk about things, right? Yeah. And so sometimes we talk about art. Yeah. How do those conversations usually start? I point to a painting and, you know, what's that or who did that? And so what sort of conversations have we had like that? The ones where it's the portraits of Goliath's head by Caravaggio, but Caravaggio's head is Goliath's head. That takes us down the path of trying to find out more information. And Didn't you have one a question about the Caravaggio painting? Was there a welt on his head? Because the first one where David's just holding his head, it's very dark, like there, it's in shadow and he has really long hair. But I think there's like a spot of blood like trickling down his face, but it's hard to see it. And I also asked, did David really, you know, cut his head off? Because that seems very violent for someone like David. Right. So we had to go back to the original source because neither one of us remembered the whole beheading thing. And, and sure enough, we found in, uh, in the Bible where it said that David cut his head off and held it up for everybody to see, didn't he? Yeah. So the great thing about this story is that Josh and I have these moments where we bond over art. And these conversations always seem to start with images being displayed on my Cambia. So the Cambia is a 17 by 28 inch digital art frame. Cambia's full HD display provides unmatched detail. There's a technology called ArtSense, just like the name of this podcast, that samples the ambient light in the room and automatically adjusts the display to heighten the sensation that you're looking at a real painting or print. Unlike a frame TV, the goal of the Cambia is an authentic viewing experience. Your Cambia provides you access to thousands of historic artworks, and premium members have access to a host of contemporary artworks as well. If you want to learn more about Cambia, head over to cambia.art and check it out. And now, my conversation with Terrell James about colorful abstractions in stone paper. James, thank you for joining me today uh, on the podcast. I'm I'm a really big fan of uh, of your work and your paintings. Maybe we could start with you. Sometimes I have folks, you know, kind of start with, you know, how would you describe your work for the the person that has never seen uh, the work of your hands? Well, thanks for asking, and it's my pleasure to be with you, Craig. Sure. Um, well, you know, I've worked in a lot of different. Uh, media. So I'm mostly known for two-dimensional work, um, painting, and I've done a lot on paper, printmaking of various kinds. I've done work in clay, three-dimensional work, cast bronze, all sorts of things. Um, I love experimenting with different materials, but I guess the thing that most all of my work has in common is some sort of exploration um, into form that interests me a lot of times it seems to be organic and looking at nature looking outdoors though it's very abstract so mm -hmm. I think a lot of my work is um, about light and how light hits certain forms um, whether that's being brought through paint or even mashing my thumb into a lump of clay you right. know, how does the shadow hit are you trying to create works that are purely abstract or do they emulate something that you're seeing or are they inspired by something you you see but come from a, a purely abstract realm does that question make you sense know, it makes a lot of sense and it's something that I would say I have several answers for, but one of them is, yeah, for the most part, I'm just starting with a color line, um, something that might be coming from my own unconscious, but it, it's all from what I've seen consciously. I mean, there's this knowledge that comes from looking, right, that, you know, our, our eyes form as babies and at first it's all a big blur and then we get to see more and more contrast and then I guess with the study of developmental psychology in children we learned we've learned a lot about how how we learn to focus um, a lot of times when people have written about what they see in my work they 
mention the idea that there is some image that almost presents itself or almost speaks its name or says, you know, that this is a uh, some sort of rock or mm-hmm. quarry or landscape tree detail of a tree. So right. <laughs> I think a lot of times, you know, I am looking at those things like, Sometimes I might even feel like I need to become more fresh in my work and I'll go work outdoors. I might go to the Arboretum and work on a drawing from trees for two hours. Then I often will come back and think it looks too, I don't know, descriptive or narrative or tight and go back over that with washes of ink. And you end up just seeing little slivers of the precision that still might say, tree bark Mm -hmm. but um, you know so there's this sort of effort I think one of the things when I was young I I used to be uh, adamant about you know someone would say well I I think I see a Tyrannosaurus Rex here in the corner of the painting right (laughs) and I'll say that is not there I certainly didn't mean that now I, I like it when people engage and see things in, in the painting that, that might be there, might not be there. I think if you see it, it's fine to say that it's there. Sure. And, you know, the word image is in imagination, so I think it's kind of cool if someone engages with an abstract image and sees something. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been reading this book called Reductionism in Art and Brain Science. And in there, this neuroscientist is a a fan of the arts as well as brain science, and he's kind of paralleling the two. And there's really interesting text in there about what in art um, makes our brain fire, like what are we enjoying? And, And, you know, he's especially looking at, you know, abstract expressionism and pure abstraction in I guess one of, you know, we talk about as an artist, there's, you know, our intention, but that only goes so far. There's the beholder share, the kind of the joy in the, the reading and the meaning that the, the viewer gets in, uh, you know, from from the work. But in the, in that book, they, he's talking about the best abstraction is kind of free from any structure or form because our our brains as a viewer are really trying to find a pattern. It's trying to find structure. It's trying to find form. And in the purest abstractions, you can't find it. You're having this experience where your brain's firing on all cylinders to try to find something. And, you know, I'm guess, and I think I hear in part of what you're saying is that sometimes do you have to fight that battle to squash things that become a little too literal in your work? Oh, certainly. Every once in a while, I'll come back in and look at a painting I worked on the day before, and suddenly there is a, you know, a clown head with a nose. (laughs) I have to get rid of that because it does, you know, sometimes you don't see things right away. And um, I often change the orientation of the canvas that I'm working on. So one day I might look at it upside down and see something that is too too much of a narrative but you know it's interesting um maybe some of the joy of looking does have to do with the uh, newness of something and Mm -hmm. and how how there's a kind of perplexity um it's a strange thing because paint itself is such a fabulous malleable material and color you know, I just I just love working with paint, and I think there's so many different elements that appeal to different senses of our senses, like you know texture and seeing the way light rakes across a bumpy part of a painting, or the way we might actually paint shadow or create shadow through an impasto paint. It's it's all all there to be seen um but i think uh there is this participation on the side the other side the viewer being involved and that's important too i think it's important for artists to remember that it's good to show your work to 
it's it's kind of the other half that has to do with the urge to communicate something outward and you know for abstract artists people who work abstractly i <laughs> think it's a little more um important to to give people a way in to understand mm -hmm. what it is so titles for instance are important for me and um you know i read a lot a lot of times i'm using phrases i might have even jotted down from poetry i've read or ideas and novels that strike me so you know just to give someone a way in um also that earlier question about whether i work abstractly from to try to be purely abstract or make references. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that there are a lot of sources that are quite, you can notice them and identify them and work. And in that very long piece, I sent you some images of yes. earlier today called Terrain. You know, there are actually things I have collected throughout my life that, mm, are, are are quite visible like there's a very large pine cone that appears about 50 feet into the piece <laughs> the piece is 101 feet long wow. and it's on the stone paper that's really fun to work on it's made from crushed marble dust but basically it's a big roll and you can see within that um you know, things that I have in the studio, fossils I've had since mm -hmm. girlhood or, you know, things I've, I've unearthed and found. Um, so I guess in a way it's kind of pulling things from my own history and maybe that will also connect to people who have had interests in things like minerals and landscape, geology. I don't know. It's, sure. And how do you see things like that? Oh, that's that's a really good question. You know, I think sometimes it's hard. Um, sometimes it's hard as an artist to like. Sometimes I feel like I approach a piece and unintentionally I'm thinking about process, right? Just because mm -hmm. I, you know, am uh, curious about the process of the artist. I remember. When I was in college, uh, I had a girlfriend who was in the symphony, and we would go to the, the symphony, and I would sit there, and I was having a much more emotional experience with the music than she was, because for her, it mm -hmm. was very, it was very tactical, like, are they, you know, are they hitting these, you know, these moments in precision the way they're supposed to, and um, but I, I think for me, I think I personally react to, to color. I react to changes in the picture plane, depth, um, mm -hmm. and um, you know implied space, all all the things. And, that... and then there's also that sort of surprise that hits you. I don't know. I've been reading a lot about surrealism lately, and sort of the, the strange displaced image in an unexpected context, or mm -hmm. how. In some ways, um, romanticism in art can be uh, glorifying the individual vision. And I think in some ways, surrealism, especially in its birth between the two world wars, was very much about blasting out old traditions and expectations from the salon and anything to do with destruction of the expected so it's sure it's uh interesting to, to try to understand well how much of people's work is is deeply their own what is it that you know that other people don't know that you want to bring forward in your work mm -hmm. and i think that that's part of the key what is it and i guess when you think about the unconscious that's really how we're forming these things that cause emotional reaction, the thing that will bring a, f a feeling to you as you're listening to a symphony, you know, what are, what are the things that leak back into your past and your life? And, you know, it's interesting too, talking about all the senses, like hearing and emotion. I understand from reading that 
the sense of smell is kind of the most elemental ancient thing that that brings associations forward mm -hmm. it's interesting that some people work with smell with scent in their work right. um you know like Anne Hamilton I think you know a lot of women I, I've seen works of that have to do with bringing the the experience of butter or honey or bourbon to the <laughs> the picture plane that brings wow. the sense so have you ever thought about um you know hitting other senses like you know I've thought about you know there's a, a particular body of work I was working at one point and in my mind it would be best observed in the gallery with the sound uh, of cicadas in the background mm. you know and Which so like so, so much on our mind this year right <laughs> and so I'm just wondering do have you ever thought about well you know, let's go back to this piece terrain that's that's kind of a site specific piece that you've created right and so, yeah, and right. And so long, long can you gone. yeah can you kind of give us a background about where where that's going to be displayed and, and how that came right. about well i it came about because i have been working for about six or seven years with a gallery in london called cadogan contemporary and mostly shown in their primary space which is on old brompton road in london and um next show i have coming up is is in october well they have a second space which is in a beautiful flowery meadow in hampshire uh it's only about i think an hour and 20 minutes from the gallery by car and um it's a gorgeous old barn and i thought i wanted to do a proposal to do some sort of installation there there have only been a few and I think it's a a great opportunity for me to expand, uh, sort of have an experience that's um, immersive. Mm -hmm. That that I you know. So I I worked on this piece and it was on two giant rolls rollers, kind of like um, tubes that that could rotate, and I only could work on about I don't know twenty feet or have the view of 20 feet at a time on mm -hmm. flat tables between the roll with the rolls at each end on tables. So I was, um, I, it's going to be a really great experience for me to get to see it all at one time. So it's going to go into this old, beautiful barn that has, um, it, it will be hung like a big capital U. Mm -hmm. So, it really will be kind of like having the, the thrill of the peripheral vision. And it's going to be um, a new experience even for me to see it that way. Sure. Um, you know, and it would be kind of great to involve sound in that. Um, but I would, my, my approach would be to collaborate with one of my friends who writes music mm -hmm. to do a sound that's specific or to collaborate with, composer friends but you know um i don't i don't feel i think for music for for any kind of soundscape to go with a piece for me it would be the joy would be kind of exploring what it's about with another person whose language is music or sound right because i don't feel like that's really my i haven't spent any time in my life working with that and, you know, I think sometimes artists make a little bit of a mistake when they uh, presume they can cover that territory without more work. For instance, we've all seen uh, performance art that doesn't really stand up to, let's say, opera that has a history and evolution that mm -hmm. is completely engrossing at every level. So, I don't know. <clears throat> Of course, it's always good to explore and experiment and stretch yourself however you can. But sometimes I think we need to also bring in um, and respect the knowledge of other lifetimes that have spent, you know, as many decades working with, say, sound as I have with color or whatever. The, that installation sounds really compelling, and it m makes me think of uh, Monet's Water Lilies at the Lingerie in, uh, in it Paris. It does. Right. Mm -hmm. It does. In fact, we're we're doing a, a book about 
my work a monograph, and um, I was so thrilled to be able to do an artist conversation with um, an art historian named Anne Dumas, who is mm-hmm. her field. Her field is mainly French painting and nineteenth, twentieth century. And she she mentioned that when we were talking about terrain, and she said it's it's really you've got to think about that experience at Laurentiary right at, at the Monet water release it's sure. just anything long and immersive I suppose it has any kind of organic field it's thrilling to even think that there's a a connection there because that piece has always meant so much to me when I've sure. seen it so tell me about stone paper. I, I feel like it's only been in the last couple of weeks that, you know, things started coming across my desk. I think I got an ad for a stone paper journal, and I really am not that familiar with with what's binding the dust together. <laughs> like, it, know, it's kind of, it kind of hurts my head to, to think. First of all, I was talking to my friend Tina Tan is a paper conservator here at the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston and she said she thinks it it's made in Taiwan where she happens to be from and she says she thinks that the word paper is a little confusing because it's not a fiber in this piece you Mm -hmm. know and she said um Maybe we should call it stone sheets or something like that. Right. <laughs> but basically, the way it's described, for, for one thing, I learned about it maybe 12 years ago from my friend Laurie Ross Paul in Portland, who's an artist in Oregon. I'm lucky enough to show in Oregon and have lots of artist friends here. And um, one of her friends who makes paints uh, was coming up with a new formula for a water based paint. She said, Why don't you? I want you to be my vehicle to explore this material, and I want you to try it on this paper. So mm-hmm. that's how I learned about it. I started using it about eight years ago. And back then it was readily available. Craig, it's not oh. anymore. It's, oh. um, it, it was something you could even order online, for instance, and now you can't. So it was. Uh, what happened was the... Uh, distributor the people who made it for art supplies it was called Terraskin, went mm-hmm. uh out of business because i think suddenly the quality control went down and all these people who were selling it couldn't sell the products they were receiving it was bumpy or something like that but the way it's described technically is that it's good for the environment because it doesn't use trees and it doesn't use paper right So what happened, my understanding is that uh, some people were watching a process of uh, some mechanical process of carving marble. I don't know if they were little busts of Thomas Jefferson or small (laughs) models of buildings in Beijing. I don't know. But basically there were chunks of marble on a floor. And you know it takes... If we study geology, it's a miracle that this stuff exists. It goes back, back, back in time. Mm -hmm. And they thought, well, this is a valuable thing that's just being swept up and thrown away. And whoever that was had the idea of creating a machine that would use that um, disused marble, the chips, and turn them into little pellets or little small oblong pieces, I think, about the size of a Benadryl tablet. Huh. And then that is saved and pulverized when it needs to be used. And the, the binder is some kind of word that starts with the word poly. It's some <laughs> sort of plastic liquid binder. And um, almost everyone listening to this podcast will have encountered this material because its commercial use is like um, menus in restaurants. Mm. that it comes in different weights and you can have very heavy weights that, you know, it's perfectly able to be cleaned. It it doesn't tear. It's very strong and stable. Right. Um, My, my understanding is that certain um, fancy stores use it for bags Mm -hmm. for their, you know, like maybe you take your little Tiffany box out in a lovely turquoise bag and it's made of this stuff. So I did, find someone who was going to Taiwan and she 
track down the maker and there is a distributor in the United States and he's in California but the problem is you know I wanted to buy some more of this paper and he said well do you have a loading dock it's very heavy mm-hmm. and he's selling things in skids so one size there would be 6,000 sheets another 8,000 so you know basically I want to try to talk him into working with um, some art supply company and and allowing it to be made again like this but the sure. the role the the hundred foot roll I was able to work on I I tracked it down you used to be able to buy this easily and there was just one left I could find and oh it was gosh. in a small small art supply store in Edmonton Canada and they didn't even sell things online wow. but I talked them into letting me have them ship it to me but this is the last one I could find and we'll see lots so- of so is it similar? I mean, I, I know that the the stone probably affects it, but is it similar to Yupo? Like you know, the, no, you know what? But I imagine this because, like Yupo, it, it doesn't really want to hold on. To, I mean, it's not porous at all. It really doesn't. You're you, right. You really have to be using like alcohol based things, otherwise it just doesn't want oh, to stick. Oh, is that the trick? Yeah, because I've done work on UFO and a year later take it to the sink it just washes right exactly. off. Exactly. But, but I've also I seen people paint with oil on UFO, which is uh, it's beautiful. And Yeah, uh, I've, I've, I've done that. It's um, This is different from UFO because it does have a way of receiving stain and pigment but it's also different from any other paper I've ever worked on, except maybe when I've done monoprints, where you can lift off some of the ink off the plate before it goes through the press. Anyway, this stuff, it's gorgeous. It looks uh, po- like polished plaster. It looks like wow. it could be something like a fresco. So the just the paper alone is beautiful enough to not feel like you must cover it with anything. But also you can lift off uh, because it doesn't absorb quickly. And mm-hmm. it does absorb, but you can, it, you know, and it depends on what inks and what you're using. I mean, I've got, that piece terrain has about 30 different things on it, including oil and oil washes and about five different kinds of ink and watercolor and uh, many different Japanese products that are, um, made to be used in calligraphy. Sure. But basically, um, it doesn't look like Yupo and it doesn't act like Yupo, but it doesn't act like regular thirsty paper either. Mm-hmm. But maybe, maybe you could talk a, a little bit about, you know, uh, in Asian materials, you know, there's like a, a long history of them creating texts and books that were kind of on these scrolls where they would you know, kind of roll from one chapter to the next. There is a um, connoisseurship of ancient Chinese scrolls and of course Japanese landscape scroll painting that um, but some of the old texts can be treasured and looked at one section at a, at a time and a I'd say a handful of my artist friends who came over to see this piece, they said, oh my gosh, I really wish you could show it like this because it's got this kind of drama of um, revealing itself one foot at a time, you know, and so that you can take it in almost cinematically. Mm-hmm. And um, actually my wonderful photographer and filmmaking assistant did do several uh, important nights in a row of, of videotaping it so it can be shown sequentially like that. Of course, it's always different when, when you're in person with a piece. But it's, um, I, I certainly did think of that, and several people who looked at it said, you know, this is strange because you're going, instead of from right to left the way we read, I, I did the piece going left to right because that's just how the role was set up on the tables. I didn't even think about it, but it it does have an Asian orientation that way. And I have been to China and Japan, and I do love looking at 
that uh, the, the beautiful history of both of those traditions. In my mind, much of your practice has come from um, working vertical on an easel or on a wall versus yes. versus down on a surface. In my mind, there's probably this sense of looking out across a landscape versus hovering over a landscape. Do you think you'll sense the piece different once it's up instead of you? Um, because I think you've probably, have you, have you seen it up on the wall or has the whole thing been, you know, on the work surface? Well, lots of layers of questions there. I know, I'm sorry. I, I, no, I can take it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I've only seen it vertically um, once and it was only about, I don't know, 11 feet of it. And we had mounted the rollers to have my professional photographer take pictures of it, but it didn't quite work. So I only saw the very end, like say the the very end, 11 feet vertically. And it was beautiful. It looked very different being able to back away and see it like that. But um, what I think makes sense, I you know, I have been working on a series of uh, pieces I call field studies, and I started them in 1996, never dreaming I would still be working on this right. in 2021. But but uh, the way I identify them is I write on the surface and I number them, kind of like when you see a wonderful mineral or, or p- sample of rock in a museum and it's got the um, ID numbers on it. So it's, um, I'm now, I think I've just finished number 762 this last week. But I always work on these flat. And there does have, there's a very different experience when something, when you're looking from above than being able to walk back and forth and seeing it on a wall. Um, This piece that is so large, I think, basically has a sort of back and forth quality of um, kind of a bird's eye view, like you're flying over it. And in some cases, there almost feels like it's, um, you know, a Landsat satellite photograph from way up above where you see patterns of the planet, you know, sort of weather patterns or something going from ocean to desert to a verdant patch of green and so there's a very far away look and then there are these areas that have quite a bit of detail where I may might have spent you know four or five hours on the one foot area drawing into them so those let's say that could be microscopic and looking at the way molecules bump into each other then there are these things that are as I mentioned earlier, drawn from sources that I look at in the studio. So, you know, um, back and forth. And I think that's a quality that I've been developing on this paper, but on much smaller pieces, you know, like regular, uh, you know, two to four foot pieces of paper rather than this scroll. But it's, it's a lot of fun to just sort of let let your mind wander as you look at it. Sure. Now the the field studies I find really interesting, and I feel like I can really identify with because a lot of my work in the past has been figurative work. But th- there was a mm-hmm. point where uh, I guess it was probably about ten years ago where you know I had um, you know, a happy accident on my palate, and I was like, this is way too beautiful to be just you know. Just, thrown away. Right. right. And, you know, right. it kind of took me down a path of, I started, you know, doing more uh, of that sort of abstraction from what I learned in that happenstance, right? But, mm-hmm. um, but th- those, those pieces are beautiful because they're, a lot of them are just, it's pure, I feel like it's pure color study. And it it's, is, that's exactly what it is. And, you know, I named them field studies because I was kind of a pun, I think, because it's like a study of the palette in my actual painting on canvas. 
so it's part of the field of my own investigation as a painter but it's really a phrase it's a reference to um, the Barbizon school um, the painters who would go and do specific studies sketches outdoors and bring those into the studio to work from on landscape painting in the 19th century so a lot of people um, I look at either work from those like say Poirot or later Cezanne who would work directly outdoors mm -hmm. and um, there's there he's one of my um, well my main love maybe uh, as an artist is Cezanne and the, the rock and quarry paintings especially but there's um, there is a joy to the spontaneity of those pieces and I think if anybody here enjoys color it just shows it really does kind of show how the mix and the drag and pull of paint can can open up an idea for a, a more formal painting I suppose I'm glad you like them I'm glad you yeah. get a chance to see them absolutely yeah. And I, I should probably inquire on how to collect uh, those because they they certainly I am uh, some you know we were talking about what resonates with me and I I'm just a real junkie for color and color theory mm -hmm. and Chevreau you know and but you know the uh, the podcast I've been I've been talking to a lot of artists and curators and folks from around the world. Uh, a lot of them are are in in the uh, usual suspects of of locations. I want to talk to you about uh, about Houston and maybe because you've you've been working in Houston for a long time, and maybe for those folks that don't know exactly how vibrant an arts community there is, maybe you can describe for us what uh, what the Houston area is like for an artist and arts professional. You know, I'm happy to talk about that because I am uh, from Houston. My my parents actually were living in Manhattan when I was going to be born. My mother flew home to have me, to have help, right? Uh, because she lived on a like fifth floor walk out walk up in the Lower East Side. But anyway, that I was in New York as a baby. We came back to Houston when I. I think my first memories are pretty much here. And I've lived a lot of different places and had studios in different cities over the years. Um, so I, I'm i lucky in that I have had a chance to experience all sorts of landscapes and studio light in places that are more known for being art centers like New York or Berlin or even places in Europe like in, in Bologna once. But I basically, Houston is um, a strange place. First of all, it's it's very open, and it's not like everyone feels like they've seen everything before. You know, it mm -hmm. does You can come up with an idea that may be new to you, and everyone will encourage that and say, oh, you know, you might look in this part of town where the studios are just opening up and very affordable, or they might say, let me introduce you to these different nonprofit spaces that might help you, you know, afford to do that project. And it, it's not like an older city that is kind of ho-hum, we've seen it all, you know? Right. <laughs> but, and I think the, the community is very supportive still. I, um, it's, it's an interesting place to work because so much of the place is, is uh, open to ideas. We have so many good things going on in theater and music and dance. And it is strangely this, the fourth largest city in the country and people don't often don't know that. Um, it's a port city. So we, we supposedly, the, the Times, New York Times said that we have the most international population of any city in the country. There's oh, wow. something like 183 languages spoken here. Oh. So it, it's, uh, it's quite something. It's a very uh, diverse place. Um, for me, I, I have all these different experiences of, of the city because 
I'm also in in some ways very much from here. For instance, the well, my mother's family's their farm is right in the middle of downtown Houston. Oh wow! So you know where the public library is was part of a farm in the 1870s or something. So you know, have that weird experience of hometown knowledge, but boy, it's become so much a more interesting place. You know, I didn't really expect to live here into my adulthood, but different things brought me back. And, you know, I really like it. It's um, it's an easy place to live. You have the luxury of space. Just have to deal with the, uh, the heat and the humidity, right? <laughs> well, it has to do with being uh, in, at a southern exposure, I suppose. But, yeah. The heat and humidity are not our best aspects, but my friends who at 18 moved to Los Angeles have much deeper wrinkles in their skin. Right. So <laughs> We look good. Exactly. We may be suffering and complaining, but we look good. Awesome. Well, it, your, your, uh, your work looks great also. And so I, um, I really uh, appreciate your time today. If, if folks wanted to keep track of, um, of you and your work and what's going on and where you're showing, where, where's the best place for, for someone to, to keep an eye on you? Well, you know, probably my website, which is just my name, T-E-R-R-E-L-L-James.com. And it, I think there's a section that says representation with the various galleries I work with, and I try to keep it more or less up to date, though I'm not the best at that, but um, with announcements of shows, and I guess um, I, I fool around with other things like Instagram, and I don't know, I, I just try to hope that the world will take note through the galleries announcements and things too sure but basically um, my next my next show is um opening i think the 11th of september and then again a second wave of opening on the 18th in dallas at barry whistler gallery okay and then this work at the barn and in london will be in october so that's Cadogan contemporary and um I think, well, let's just hope we can all find each other one way or another, psychically, (laughs) (laughs) internet-wise. People who love color finding each other. You know, I do think it's amazing having these systems that we can learn from, like podcasts. And I don't know, just today I was looking at um, Instagram and learned about three different incredible women painters I'd never known who were British and earlier part of this century and last century, whatever, who, who maybe their prime time was in the sixties and Mm -hmm. seventies, but it's just such a marvelous tool to learn about other artists. Absolutely. You know, one thing leading to another. So it's nice for me to get to talk to you and and try to keep talking and finding people who make, uh, keep opening up the world to you, which is, Sounds like, to me, part of your mission with the podcast. I think it's great. Absolutely. And so... Well, thank you yeah. so much. Thank you. And... Uh... And now, the news. If you ever have some time on your hands and want an interesting read... Check out the Wikipedia page for Doris Duke. In 1925, at just 13 years old, Doris became the primary heir of the Duke family fortune, a family fortune amassed through monopolizing the tobacco industry and being the first big investors in hydroelectric power. At her father's death, half of the money went to the trust her father had set up prior to his death to support education in the Carolinas, for example, Duke University and the other half went to Doris. Her life became one of extravagance. Estates in Hawaii and Beverly Hills, multiple penthouses in New York, her own 737 with a bedroom that looked like it was from a house, and a massive art collection. Picasso, Van Gogh, Rembrandt, Monet, and one of the most sizable collections of Islamic and Southeast Asian art. 
which brings us to the curious events of October 6th, 1966. That afternoon, Duke was visited at her estate in Newport, Rhode Island by her interior designer and art consultant, Eduardo Terea, who had come to the residence to let Duke know that he had taken a job in Hollywood as a production designer and would be gathering his things. What followed gets a little hazy, but what we know for sure is that Duke hit Terea with her car and Terea was dead at the scene. The haziness was compounded by massive amounts of philanthropy that poured from Duke into the Newport community not long after the accident. Now, 55 years after the accident, the case is being reopened based on research from journalist Peter Lance, who is publishing a book on the events surrounding the accident. Among the inconsistencies is the physical evidence from the scene, which indicates rapid acceleration from a much further distance, causing a much greater impact than what Duke described. And there's the new testimony of a man named Bob Walker, who was a 13-year-old paperboy at the time. He was afraid to come forward in 1966 with testimony about how, on his way to deliver Duke's newspaper, he heard intense shouting followed by a moment of silence, the roar of a motor, a crash, and the screaming of a man. By the time Walker biked to the scene, Duke was out of the car assessing the situation. The paper boy asked if he could help her, and she repeatedly shouted that he should get the hell out of there. It's hard to determine what can be accomplished since all the interested parties are now deceased, but perhaps justice can be served in some small measure. Check out more detail of Walker's account in Lance's recent Vanity Fair article or spring for the upcoming book, Homicide at Rough Point. New York has a problem with a massive and expensive public art installation, and the answers are not easy. Vessel is a 160-foot-tall honeycomb of staircases designed by Thomas Heatherwick that is the centerpiece of the city's Hudson Yard development. You have probably seen pictures of the piece at this point because of its incredibly Instagrammable structure in the middle of one of the world's most populous cities. When under development, the piece was derided for its cost, estimated somewhere in the range of 150 to 200 million dollars. And since its opening, there has been questions about handicap access. Because the structure is all stairs, those with mobility issues couldn't enjoy the structure. The solution there was to design a custom elevator unlike anything else in the world after the fact to accommodate those that they should have thought about from the beginning. That sounds expensive. But the most damning consequence of building a 16-story structure with public access is a recent rash of suicides by jumping from the top of the structure. Vessel's been closed to the public since the most recent event last Thursday while officials evaluate how to prevent future accidents. The problem is it's not clear how to modify the structure in a way that guarantees these types of accidents don't happen again. Some are calling for Vessel's destruction. Some are even suggesting dropping it offshore to serve as an entertainment venue for divers. There are no clear answers, so stay tuned to see how this one plays out. The art collection of Dallas oil tycoon Edwin L. Cox will soon be going under the hammer. Cox's name is one very familiar to me because of his unbelievable generosity to Southern Methodist University, where I went to college. My MBA is actually from the Edwin L. Cox School of Business at SMU. It turns out that Cox left a substantial collection of Impressionist and Post-Impressionist paintings when he passed away at the age of 99 last November. Among those are a highly prized Kaibat whose pre-auction estimate is being placed at $50 million, as well as a splendid Van Gogh that's expected to go for roughly $40 million, and a Cezanne that's expected to fetch thirty-five. These are accompanied by works from Monet, Sisley, and Vuillard. It's anticipated that the Christie's auction for the collection will generate international interest from both private and institutional buyers. That's all the time we have for this week. You've been listening to ArtSense. You can find the show on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. If you've enjoyed this podcast, be sure to subscribe. And while you're there, please rate the show and leave a quick review. Your feedback is the key to other folks finding us. 
If you'd like to see images related to the conversation, read a transcript, and find other bonus features, you can go to cambia.art and click on the podcast tab. If you'd like to reach out to me, you can email me at craig at cambia.art. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.